Alrighty, thank you so much. If you're rejoining us for the Founder Track at Twin Cities Startup Week, welcome. If this is your first time, we're so excited for you for this particular session. We have a very exciting session that explores how is the Minnesota startup market perceived by out-of-state VCs. And we have with us a veteran of Twin Cities Startup Week, Ryan. I feel like we, I need to have like smoke and mirrors and everybody stand up and hand clap and to introduce, <laughs> to introduce Ryan. Very seriously, Ryan Bashar is the co-founder and general partner for Matchstick Ventures, a pre-seed and seed stage venture capital fund that focuses on the North and the Rockies. I love that, the North and the Rockies in Minnesota, we like to say we the North. Prior to Matchstick, Ryan was the co-founder of Beta and Twin Cities Startup Week. So now you see why I want the smoke and mirrors. Give, give a round of applause for Ryan. He was also the founder for Techstars. The first, he was also the founder of the first Techstars in the Twin Cities, uh, Techstars Retail Accelerator with Target. He currently, reside with, he currently resides with his young family in my favorite, no, let me not say that, in St. Paul, Minnesota. So please welcome Ryan. Uh, yeah, no, no smoke and mirrors, please. I appreciate it. Uh, very excited to be here um, and uh, have our, our panelists here as well. Um, so the title of this event um, is How is the Minnesota Startup Market Perceived by Out-of-State VCs? We've got three great VCs from out-of-market actually here uh, in the Twin Cities. They spend a lot of time in this market. And um, I want to use this as an opportunity for founders and people in this market to kind of understand what's happening at a national level and get different perceptions of best practices, trends we're seeing in the market, and how that relates to what's happening here in Minnesota. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm with Matchstick Ventures. We invest in this market. We also invest in uh, other regions of the country, like the Rockies or, or other markets. So we, we tend to see a lot of different trends um, across the market, but I want to get some, some uh, new perspectives here. So um, we'll do some intros here in a second, a little bit of housekeeping. We'll do uh, about half of this will be uh, me asking questions and getting ideas from the panelists. The other half, um, we'll do a Q&A from the audience, and or if you're streaming online, you can type in your questions on, on Hopin, and we'll get, get those relayed up to our, our panelists. So um, without further ado, I want to get some intros here started. So um, Dan, why don't you kick it off, tell us a little bit about yourself, your fund, and um, your interactions with the market today. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Dan. Uh, I'm a partner on the investment team at OpenView. Um, so at OpenView, you know, our focus is investing in what we call the expansion stage uh, into software companies. Um, so primarily Series A and Series B. And we're looking for companies that, you know, have product market fit. They probably have customers. Those customers have been around for a while, but they're still very early on in their journey of scaling. Um, and we have a lot of resources to help companies, you know, along that journey. So, you know, we've had the opportunity to partner with lots of great companies, folks like Datadog, Calendly, Expensify, uh, as well as some great folks in the Midwest, too. So Lessonly, which just had a great outcome, Project 44, uh, and EndCamp. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Uh, prior to OpenView, uh, I've actually spent a lot of time in the Midwest myself. Um, my wife is actually from Minnesota, uh, so a lot of family here as well. Um, and I spent uh, six years living in Chicago and actually started my investing career uh, at Hyde Park Angels uh, in Chicago and invested in Branch here in Minneapolis during my time there, um, as well as a lot of other great Midwest startups. So thanks for having me, Ryan. Awesome. Thanks. Graham? Hi, at Graham Ober from Revolution, uh, based in San Francisco. Uh, Revolution is a multi-stage uh, venture capital firm, so we kind of have three core strategies. We have an early stage seed fund called the Rise of the Rest Seed Fund. Um, they invest about $500,000 into rounds being led by others. Um, I work on our venture practice, which is sort of a classic Series A, Series B um, focused group. Um, we're a small team, about five of us, um, split between Washington, DC, and San Francisco. Um, we only lead deals and we write checks anywhere from two to 12 million. Uh, and then we usually reserve sort of one to two times uh, for follow-ons. Um, our industry focus is really mostly in the consumer space as well as some vertical software and B2B um, oriented companies. Um, we spend a lot of time in FinTech um, as well as, um, you know, kind of broader the broader consumer landscape. Um, 
we also have a later stage growth fund called Revolution Growth. Um, they invest sort of Series C and beyond. Um, they write sort of 20 to $60 million checks. Um, we have a fairly concentrated approach, so we do about three to five new investments a year um, in, a, in a normal year. This year we've already done five, but uh, we'll probably get to that later. Um, and yeah, excited to be here today. Um, my background is in, is in fintech. I was at a startup called NerdWallet in San Francisco um, early on and was there for about four years um, leading some product initiatives. Um, and yeah, excited to be here. Awesome. Thanks. Masha? Yeah. Hey, everyone. So I'm Masha Kusid. I'm a partner at Drive Capital. Drive's based in Columbus, Ohio. And actually, our core thesis and our core mandate is to invest in companies that are being built outside of Silicon Valley versus inside Silicon Valley. So the founders of the firm were actually at Sequoia, which was investing globally in these kind of boots on the ground strategies in terms of opening up offices in places like China and India, but still ignored the rest of the country back in 2013, 2012. So the founders of the firm and my partners, Chris and Mark, left with the initial insight that, hey, what if the next great opportunity for venture capital or the next emerging market is actually just the rest of the country. So we invest exclusively east of the Rockies, west of the Hudson, all the way up to Waterloo, down to Austin. Um, we manage 1.2 billion. We'll go out and just about double that here the back half of the year. So certainly the largest firm in terms of AUM between the coasts. We're stage agnostic, so we'll invest anything from pre-seed to later stage fast growing venture rounds. Um, and we're also extremely thematic. So we think pretty deeply about markets and try to invest in market defining companies. Actually, we have two uh, investments in the Minneapolis area, a uh, branch and when I work. I'm in town kind of finishing up diligence on a company that has um, uh, extensive customer presence here as well. So it's a market we continue to be excited about as long, along with the, you know, the rest of that kind of, as we call it the driveway, but that's just us. Awesome, thanks. Uh, yeah, very lucky to have our, our panelists here. I know you guys spend a lot of time in, in the Minnesota market. We get a chance to work with you a lot with, with Matchstick, which we love as well. Um, so, you know, back to the, the, con the um, title of, of this is, you know, what, how are out-of-market VCs perceiving Minnesota? And I talked to you guys a little bit about this. Like, I don't want this to be a, a critique on Minnesota or like this kind of like, you know, what's wrong with this market and what works at other markets. What I, what I hope people in the audience and, and uh, who are online get from this is, is more of like, what are the best practices you guys are seeing in other markets that the founders in this market can also use and be able to translate to be able to work with folks like, like yourself and or just think about their company at a, at a much bigger scale than just in, in the regional market. So, um, you know, one of the, the questions that I get a lot, um, you know, investing in, in companies in this, and we try to work with this at Matchstick, is, you know, what does it really take for a company let's say, in a non-traditional market like, like Minneapolis or, uh, or St. Paul, like what really takes for those companies to stand out to be for a out-of-market VC to actually step in and be like, yeah, this is, this is something that I'm willing to invest in, I'm willing to travel to, I'm willing to, to dive into. So I don't know if there's like certain traits or characteristics you guys are really looking for in your founders that helps them stand out if they're not in your home market. And maybe some trends you maybe have seen recently that have you know helped uh, you know founders in in non traditional markets as well. So um, I, I'll leave it up to if someone wants to jump in with with one of the answers here. But I'm sure you guys all have some some pretty good ideas and advice. Yeah, sure. I, I can jump in quickly. Yeah. Um, so one thing I didn't mention about Revolution is our focus is also like drive uh, on investing outside of traditional VC hubs of San Francisco, Boston, New York. So while I'm based in San Francisco, that's more for legacy reasons. We are, our companies are all over the country. Um, and one of the things that we look for um, in understanding a market really well and knowing that it would be a good place for us to invest is um, a a strong university ecosystem um, where there's sort of a pipeline of talent that is interested in startups that will work for startups, um, and two, a, a sort of large um, incumbent industry or industries um, that has sort of the network of people and expertise in certain areas that are relevant to uh, those industries that the startups are, are in. Um, and I think something that's super interesting to me about this market is that there's such a diversity of large incumbent companies here. You have consumer companies, you have fintech or you know legacy financial services companies, um, medical insurance companies companies, all sorts of things that a lot of other markets don't have. A lot of other markets tend to be, um, you know, more focused on one big market. If you think about Detroit, you know, the automotive industry or, um, you know, in Tennessee, you know, a lot of logistics type of companies. So to me, that's something that's really interesting about this market and why we're excited about it. Um, I think 
you know, in, in years past, what we've seen is there's been a lot of companies coming out of this area focused on med tech and then ag tech, um, which for us are two areas that we just haven't spent a lot of time in and aren't really that focused on. Um, a little bit more in ag tech, but certainly not in med tech. Just there's a lot of investors who know that market a lot better than us and who are, you know, scientists or doctors or whatever that, that can that invest in those companies um, more effectively than we can. Um, but that has really changed, I think, in the last two to five years. You know, there's been a lot more um, diversity of companies coming from this area um, in fintech, in, you know, uh, health tech that's, you know, not regulated healthcare. Um, and so we're really excited about all of that. And I think that's unique to this market um, that we haven't seen as much from other markets, the diversity of kind of uh, types of companies. Yeah. Right on. Uh, Masha, you guys are investing also exclusively out of the coast. Like, what really stands out to you about Minnesota entrepreneurs and, you know, some of the characteristics that you guys like to invest in that you see here? Yeah, just to piggyback a little bit off the previous answer, I mean, we do feel strongly that the best companies are going to be built close to their customers, right? So if the unfair advantage used to be server farms and infrastructure and engineers concentrated in San Francisco, we just don't think that exists any longer. So if you're building product, you're going to iterate faster if you're close to your customer. So certainly the density of large companies in this Twin Cities area is, is important to our thesis. But in terms of founders themselves, I think you'll find in the Midwest this kind of grittiness that perhaps, I mean, I don't want to speak down on San Francisco people, but like <laughs> are more, you know, they're, they're, they're willing to make a dollar last longer, right? That's kind of just core to the types of personalities that are here. It's how people are raised. Um, there's a bit of a chip on your shoulder, right? Like you went to a state school probably if you're a founder here. Um, maybe this beautiful campus here. And that type of um, kind of tenacity really comes through in this part of the country, and it's those are the types of founders we love to work with. Nice. Well, and Dan, so with OpenView, you guys are looking across the country, right? And you guys are East Coast based. Um, I guess what draws you into Minnesota and the entrepreneurs? I know you have connections here, but I mean, you guys are very proactively looking at stuff here it, when you couldn't be looking all across the country. I guess what draws you to, to the, the teams and the founders here? Yeah, I think a lot of the things that uh, Graham and Masha said kind of come to mind to me. So the density of expertise uh, in particular types of industries, so whether it's retail, healthcare, insurance in this market is really strong. And those are all industries uh, that we're really excited about and interested in. And I think the other thing, and this is certainly like painting with a broad brush and there's you know a lot of different skill sets and, and outlooks everywhere. Um, but you know, if we think about how we you know, evaluate founders, too, you know, that's can be a very subjective exercise, which we want to avoid. We don't want to just come out of meeting and say like, oh yeah, uh, I liked her, she's great, like we should invest. And so the, the rubric we use for that is, you know, things like background, you know, folks here, if they're building in one of those industries and have worked at some of these large companies are more likely to have the relevant background to then go and start those, you know, vertical software companies that are operating in those industries or another thing that we look for is perseverance. Um, and Masha, you know, talked about, you know, how folks here may come by that uh, in a different way than, than folks elsewhere, which I think is all all really important. Um, and so one thing also you, you talked about, Ryan, was like, well, where, you know, what are the differences between folks here and folks elsewhere? And the one thing I will say, um, you know, obviously another thing we look for is kind of vision and like how big is the vision, how big is the market, how big is the opportunity? And that's one where I think people here, um, you know, can continue to, to focus on. And so when I think about like relative strengths uh, and relative areas to, to grow, that's kind of one where it's like, again, this is a very broad characterization, but you know, continue to encourage folks as these markets get bigger, especially these vertical markets where there is a lot of expertise, continue to think about how big can it be, how big can the vision be, um, and how big can this company be that's being built here? Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a fair, fair critique. And, and, and I think you see that and that's just, I don't think that's Minnesota specific either, right? It's just really just a matter of like, if, if you're gonna be pursuing venture capital in general, you gotta have pr a pretty big vision for what it, what it can become and, and thinking through the strategy for, for pursuing that vision. Um, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm kind of curious to get your guys' take on is just like the, the COVID effect of how that's um, transformed your, your firms into like pursuing uh, investments in these markets. You know, it's much more digital. We see it a lot at Matchstick where, you know, people are much more willing to invest 
and I know it's core to some of your theses, but like the ability to engage, like how, how do you suspect that you know, Minnesota entrepreneurs can engage with you guys openly? Um, is this like usually a virtual first or is it starting to be in person? I guess, and how you see that you know, going forward for, for the firm? I know there's a lot <laughs> to, to be determined uh, in the market as a whole, but I guess I, I kind of want to hear a little bit of inside baseball of like how you guys are thinking about um, your firm and engaging in, in out of market uh, founders going forward. So, Dan, you want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the, the really nice thing about the, you know, explosion of Zoom and Zoom meetings is it does really lower the barriers and the friction between, like, building relationships and making connections. And the thing that I've seen on the positive side, it's a lot easier to meet a lot more people. Um, but the thing that, like, I always try to keep in mind and would encourage, like, entrepreneurs, especially, you know, anywhere, but certainly including in Minneapolis, is, like, a, make sure to build like a deep relationship with folks also and not just like use Zoom to your advantage so you can have a ton of, you know, meetings once or twice. Um, but, you know, these investments are, you know, five, seven, ten year relationships. And so really to get, really getting to know someone, you know, deeply understand their motivations, understand what they want, understand what's the definition of success uh, for, you know, in your eyes for your company versus in an investor's eyes. Um, and that does, uh, you know, and it would be interesting, maybe other folks have a different perspective, but I do think meeting in person is still like a really big and really important part of that. And so use kind of the, the remote tools to your advantage of being able to target folks, you know, have easier meet, first meetings on Zoom that maybe, you know, would have been more difficult to have previously, but don't, you know, lose sight of the fact that like these are really long-term, you know, engagements and relationships and you kind of do need to transition into the real world and have these deeper kind of conversations conversations uh, and the best way to do that I do think is in person so you know let it you know be a way to open the door but then you kind of have to walk through the door as well instead of just open a lot of doors but not walk through any yeah right on um, so we, we've taken this approach of there's just absolutely no substitute for in-person, and we think our unfair advantage for the last 12 months and going forward for however long is our ability and desire and want to get on planes and meet people in person. Um, so we'll continue to do that, and we'll also continue to encourage our portfolio companies, potential portfolio companies, to get back in the office, co-locate, iterate for people that feel comfortable, obviously, but like we just think you're going to move 10x faster than your competitors if you're doing it in person and iterating on product next to person. And we, as your board members or your investors, will be there right there alongside with you and coming to board meetings in person and, and trying to get kind of the magic that happens in a room together that you really can't replicate over Zoom, unfortunately. Yeah, completely agree with that. And I think for us, you know, we used to spend a lot of time on planes as it as it was, um, you know, traveling to markets like here and other places um, to really try and meet people. Um, I think, you know, if anything, this has made things more efficient for both founders and for us. We can have a lot more first meetings, um, which makes, you know, the second or third meeting a lot more um, meaningful. And, um, you know, you're able to get into deeper discussions because you've kind of already, from both sides, filtered out who might be a good fit for you as an investor and as a founder, you know, you might find that you might like some investors more than others or whatever. And so, you know, you're able to spend your time more efficiently in person too. Um, but we have found certainly that there is definitely no substitute for at least one in-person meeting before we close an investment, just because there's so much that comes from being able to just have a casual conversation with someone where it's not overly structured on Zoom, where you're just running through an agenda and, you know, you're not able to really get to know people. And, um, you know, I think most venture capital investments now um, last last longer than the average marriage in the US. And so, you know, it really is a multi-year relationship and, you know, you want to have a good relationship with people and, and that's hard to do when it's just strictly, you know, on Zoom. Yeah, right on. Uh, has, has any of your firms made an investment without meeting the, the founder in person during COVID? Uh, yeah, we have, You've once or twice. Okay, yeah. anyone else? We've made um, the first investment that we did during COVID. Um, just one of us um, had had met uh, had, had met the team, and then we've made one investment where none of us have met the team in person. Okay, and Masha. I think at this point we've met them all in person, but okay. out of necessity, we we did make some investments without yeah. meeting in person. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. At this okay. point, we've met everyone, and like okay. it is like all else equal. Like we're going like 
Exactly like Grandma Masha said, like we want to meet people in person, <laughs> but the reality like 12, 14 months ago made that tough. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, and I, I think it's it's good advice for the, the founders on the in the audience and on the stream here is that, you know, a lot of these deals, while we think that COVID made this all virtual, I think it's very much gonna get back into like an in-person, like when you guys are in town, being able to meet with people in town, uh, for founders to get on a plane to come meet you if there happens to be either at your office or at a, a, a you know shared location or something. Um, I do foresee being part of it, but probably more of it, like some some of the process being very much digital, right, or, or virtual, whilst you know having that in-person component is a big deal. We do, at Matchtech we did I think three deals with without meeting the founders and uh, in, in person, including some in the Twin Cities, which is kind of weird when it's like a couple miles away. Um, but you know, since then I've met met everybody multiple times. Um, so. One one thing I want to get into is Dan mentioned uh, a little bit about like kind of the bigger mentality, like thinking about your company outside of your your region and and um, you know pushing entrepreneurs to think about that. When you think about uh, maybe this is to the Minnesota market, but much broader of of investing and in kind of out of the coast. Like what are what are the you mentioned some of the characteristics you really like about the founders you know, in these markets and in comparing that to maybe, you know, other markets you're seeing. Um, but is there any advice or um, for, for the founders as they start to think about raising capital and really competing on like a national, if not, you know, international stage or, you know, any advice you'd have for them? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is kind of be cognizant of uh, your network and, and where you need to kind of fill in gaps. So one thing I see a lot of times with folks who are, you know, in the Bay Area is incredible, like technological background and expertise and network, but, you know, they're building a vertical solution in an industry that they don't, they haven't really worked in, uh, you know, they maybe got exposed to it tangentially or something, and they really need to, you know, spend more time chatting with folks who run P&Ls in that industry or own businesses in that industry. Uh, and I would say probably the inverse for folks who aren't in some of those big hubs is they have incredible expertise about how these industries work, about what the customer's problems are, and they're going to have a huge advantage building technology for those industries. Um, but I do think there's also value in speaking with, and depends on the nature of the product, like is it infrastructure, is it application, but there's always value. And again, you know, we only do software, so speaking from a software lens here, of making sure you have folks in your network who have been executives at Atlassian or Datadog or wherever else, um, so you can get a sense for like, well, how, how should we build those engineering organizations? How should we build a go-to-market organization that's you know, product-led and self-serve? And what are the things we should be looking for? Whatever the case may be for that business. Um, but really, you know, augmenting your network and being aware again, from the software perspective of if you're building a vertical software company, again, speaking in generalities, it's likely if you're in this market, like you have a ton of relevant, you know, vertical expertise, um, but maybe not as much exposure to, you know, the Atlassians, the Dead Dogs, whomever of the world. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would add to that. I think that, you know, leverage your investors. I mean, our, our job is really to be sort of a router of information and uh, a router of people and, and kind of connecting people and, and making the networks of our founders stronger. And so, you know, we spend a ton of time with people that are probably relevant to what you're building or doing. And so really push on your investors for those introductions and those relationships, because that's what we're here for. But we also have, you know, a lot of portfolio companies. So we might not think proactively about, you know, one specific specific intro or whatever it is, but, you know, really leverage, um, leverage your investors as much as you can. Yeah, one thing I might add that hasn't been mentioned is, I, I don't know if it's a function of the investors that exist in this region, but sometimes I think entrepreneurs get really caught up in selling this kind of metrics-driven story and like, hey, I've reached a million dollars in ARR, so I should be able to reach a X, uh, uh, you know, size series A. Like for, for us, revenue is a lagging indicator, right? So there's a lot of other things that you can be demonstrating to investors that show this is actually a huge market and maybe it's not a huge market that exists today, but be able to sell that more so than the traction that you know might be a myopic view of a larger market. So I would encourage founders here not to get too caught up in you know milestone-based uh, metrics and pushing that forward and really selling the larger vision. Yeah, I love that. Um, I want to get to some questions here, either from the audience uh, or online. I've got one more, um, and then we'll, yeah, I'll open up to that. But, you know, I think one of the advantages in the Twin Cities market is we have so many corporate 
um, potential customers, expertise, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's very dispersed, right? Like we've got everything from healthcare to retail to agriculture. You know, you could go down the line where we've got multiple Fortune 500s. Amazing thing to happen. It, do you guys see that as like, a, a, well, and, and compared to other markets where maybe they're like all in on just like, just healthcare or just agriculture or something. Do you guys see that as like an advantage or is it kind of a distraction because there's just, you know, so many, <laughs> you know, what what are we known for, you know? And it's kind of known for a, a lot of different things. Is that like a, a blessing or, or a curse? Um, I, I can start off. I think, yeah. I think founders here, maybe we've already touched on this a bit, that we get really excited about are the ones that are solving their own problems, right? So whatever that vertical might be, they need to be laser focused on solving that problem for their potential customers. I sound a bit like a broken record, but um, I think those are the founders that really stand out and that are not trying to be all things to all people, right? So they're not trying to go after agriculture and retail and X, Y, Z, because they're so laser focused on what they've been feeling themselves for the last however many years. So they just had to go leave their like cushy corporate job and become a founder. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I definitely see it as a positive to me, uh, just as somebody who, you know, spends time lots of different cities, um, like Minneapolis is more appealing to me because there is this diversity of skill set, whereas, you know, I'll do some healthcare, but I also want to do, or at least see, like, the best software deals in agriculture, in retail, or in insurance. And so the fact that, like, lots of those opportun uh, opportunities will tend to be here as opposed to a city that's like, you know, we're all insurance or we're all healthcare, to me, provides more opportunity and makes it more likely that there's gonna be something really interesting being built here. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would add that from the investor's perspective, it's obviously great for us, right? Because we can kind of come to one place and there's a bunch of different things that might pique our interest. But um, to Masha's point, I think having a really strong focus on what, you're, what the problem you're actually solving is and making sure that, you know, your customers aren't, you know, you're not, just because you're here, you're not trying to target every single customer that just happens to be here, even if they're in different industries, if that's not what you're trying to solve for. So um, I think from the founder side, you know, being really focused um, is important. And so, you know, while, while it's great for us, you know, I think for you, it, it can present challenges of, of potentially being distracted. So just, you know, being aware of that, I think is, is good. Yeah, right on. Um, all right. So let's open up to some questions. I don't know if anyone in the audience or if we have uh, any online. Yeah, we have, um, well, Tim Anderson wants your contact information. <laughs> we, can, we can get that out, yeah. But I think um, that kind of leads to a bigger, I'll take my mask off, that leads to a bigger question um, for first-time founders who maybe haven't engaged with investors before. Do you have any recommendations on the best way to engage with investors such as yourself, and what kind of experience can they expect? Um, at least speaking for us at Revolution, you know, we're always, I mean, our, our day, as we like to say, our day job is talking to founders. And so while that might not be the founder's day job, it is for us. And so that's kind of what we do all day. So um, absolutely, we, I mean, our contact information, I'm sure, will be shared. So feel free to reach out to me or anyone on, on our team um, whenever. Um, we're always happy to chat. I, I would say that said, um, make sure you have something that you're looking to get out of that conversation. Make sure you're um, not just just sort of looking for general advice. You know, sometimes we get people who you know, get on Zoom or the phone with us and they just say, you know, what's your general advice? And it's, it's hard for us to be able to answer that because we don't know much about them or what they're trying to solve or uh, where they are or what industry they're in. So I would say, you know, have, um, have a specific list of questions or things that you're trying to accomplish with the conversation, um, whether it's fundraising, whether it's just trying to build a relationship, but um, really try and come with, um, come with a purpose. Yeah, uh, I think for us, exactly what Graham said, it's like we want to talk to uh, as many entrepreneurs that we think are relevant or, or could be relevant to our focus uh, as we can, and we want to be aware of as many of those as we can. So certainly, like, 
I would love to receive emails from you know as many founders as, as possible. One thing I will say when when doing that that I think is a helpful tactic is like don't just send like the generic email of like okay I copy pasted this I'm going to send this to you know the 50 best VCs I can find or the 50 most interesting VCs like doing something creative saying you know why are you reaching out to this specific fund or this specific person creating a Loom video that walks through your product and talks about you know what why you think that you know a particular person or fund is a good fit. It. Um, or do, I mean, there's all sorts of great creative tools now that you can use like Loom to, to do stuff like that. Uh, and I think that stuff really stands out and certainly, you know, makes it a lot more likely that it catches folks' attention. Um, but I'm not like a big, certainly if you have like an in, a warm introduction, like that's great. That will be better, you know, speaking objectively, uh, just for the industry, not necessarily for us in particular. Um, but don't be afraid to just reach out if you don't have a warm introduction. I, I don't think think that's like, uh, it's not a recipe for success. I don't think that's how our industry should operate, and I don't think that's how uh, CEOs, uh, you know, should operate either. Right. I don't have much to add. Agreed. <laughs> reach out. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, we're going back there, right here. Um, so when it comes to location, how much, you guys kind of touched on it before, but um, how much weight does that have when it comes into like your decision making? Um, like what space you're in, what company you're trying to invest in, and if they're surrounded by similar companies? I guess speaking for, for us, um, I wouldn't say, I mean, being in this market, I would say, is an advantage to you for us because that's what we like to do. We like to invest in places like this. Um, I would say it's more. It's less of a sort of check the box factor and more of a is it does it make sense, right? So if you're an autonomous, we don't invest in autonomous vehicles, but if you're an autonomous vehicle startup, it probably makes a lot of sense for you to be in Detroit, right? It just sort of does. So that would be a, if you were in Miami building an autonomous vehicle company, like maybe that doesn't make sense and we would sort of question it, but it's not like a big factor in terms of, um, in terms of whether we would invest or not. Yeah, for us, it comes back to this idea of being close to your customers. So exactly these examples make all the sense in the world. I think one thing we haven't really touched on as a panel is the ability to retain talent in these markets as well. So that's kind of one advantage that a city like Minneapolis gives you, where you have like the targets of the world pulling interesting, smart people here that then are going to want to go work at interesting startups. Um, so we see that as a total advantage as well. Yeah, I think for me, you know, I view it as positive. I'm still relatively early in my career, so my willingness to like get on a plane and, and do those types of things and meet with great companies who aren't in these big tech hubs, like I would love to do more of that. Uh, that's kind of what I do want to do. And then in terms of like the competitive landscape or things like that, like, yeah, I mean, to me, like geography, I do agree, like, probabilistically, you're more likely to be successful if you're close to your customers. Like, absolutely, there's no doubt. Um, but there is just an alchemy of, like, if it's the right person and it's an interesting market and it's a defensible technology, then, like, it could be, you know, for us, our only limitation, we're a global firm. We've invested in companies in Australia, Israel. Um, as long as they're selling into the North American market, that's where we feel like we can help. That's where our networks are. But beyond that, like, you know, I would go anywhere if it were an interesting company. And I would prioritize things that are not in places that other people are disproportionately looking, because that's where I feel like I have a relative competitive advantage. Yeah, I would just add quickly that, you know, make sure that the investor that you're talking to or pitching to is interested in that area, right, or has a stated interest in, you know, some, some investors really only like to invest in very specific geographic regions. And so for them, it might not work, right? But for, I would say for at least the uh, us type of people, you know, it's certainly not a disadvantage. Right on. We've got one more uh, in the back there. Thanks. I'm curious if there are any particular areas or industries that you're especially excited about based on innovation you're seeing. And conversely, if there are areas that you think are ripe for innovation that you're going to be keeping an eye on. Yeah, I'm happy to, to start. Uh, one area that you know we've spent time in as a firm, we have an investment in a company called Project 44, based in Chicago. It's in the supply chain industry. Um, you know, a very very interesting company, doing really well. Uh, and what they do is they basically you know take uh, information about where things are in supply chains and connect that, that instead of using a technology called EDI, which is you know relatively or it is old and antiquated. They're using kind of more modern API infrastructure, and um, you know that helps you do 
do a lot of things, but to answer your question, it's kind of a testament to the world of supply chain. It's like very interconnected, a lot of networks, so there's a lot of opportunity for virality and you know defensible competitive advantages within that industry just because of how it works structurally. And then when you think of you know everything comes from somewhere, right? Um, and so it touches you know, the entire economy, it touches the entire globe, so it's a massive, massive market. And when you think about, and this is kind of like a little bit of my philosophy and like a more general answer to your question of like, when you think about how much technology is uh, present in different areas of the economy and the GDP, obviously you know, technology itself is a huge part of GDP now, but things like supply chain or manufacturing or you know, any of these like real world industries, like the prevalence of technology that those industries is much lower than it is in others, and that's where I think there's going to be the most opportunity because it's inevitable in my eyes that, like, you know, the classic like software is eating the world type of concept. Like, certainly, I wouldn't be doing this job if I didn't believe that. Um, and so that that's the biggest one for me that where I spend time. It's also my background. I actually worked uh, at Target uh, for a few years in supply chain, so it's like also something I have facility with. Um, but uh, yeah, that would be my perspective. So the kind of easy cop-out answer for me is everything can be disrupted, right? Um, I think if you had asked me that question 12 months ago or 16 months ago, I would have said education kind of clearly coming out of the pandemic or coming into the pandemic. So we made a number of investments um, in the education space over the last 12 months because we're always looking for real fundamental why nows. Like as investors, that's like our North Star is big markets and clear why nows, um, which are not always clear until 20 years later. Um, so we had a, a tech company in our portfolio go public a few weeks ago, Duolingo. We've made a lot of early stage investments in the sector over the last 12 months, like I mentioned. Um, I mean, the company I'm in town for, Ryan, you'll appreciate this, is in the travel space. So clearly there's been a, a real fundamental shift in how we get on planes and, and other modalities. So as we think about industries like that, that again, take up a large portion of our GDP and will continue to evolve as we move out of this pandemic. Those are ones that I'm spending time on and excited by. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll give you two. One is um, the aging process. So getting old is really hard, whether it's signing up for Medicare or figuring out where to live or how to manage your finances, um, where to put your parents in a nursing home or take care of them as they get older. Um, all of that has um, really um, lagged in having any sort of technological disruption or solutions for that. And so we spend a lot of time there um, trying to find companies that are um, looking to make that process easier for people. Um, and then we also spend a lot of time in the pet space, so, you know, sort of an obvious one as well. Um, you know, pets uh, sort of blew up over COVID, you know, uh, shelters, uh, animal shelters uh, completely drained of, of any inventory, which, which is great, but, um, you know, sort of the pet um, buying or pet finding experience is still really hard, you know, finding either a rescue dog or a cat or a, you know, reputable breeder, um, and then also healthcare for pets um, is just really a challenging um, thing. Thing for people, you know, the, the vet industry has changed dramatically in the past five years, and so um, we spend a lot of time in that category. Nice. I'm glad you got. No one said CryptoPunks or you know Dogecoin or something. We're good. Um, any other questions? We're, we got like one minute left here. If anyone has one, up here. Yeah. Okay. One last one from online uh, from Thomas Kozguy. Uh, most startups here don't raise a ton of money. What is your guys' view on this, especially considering that we lead the nation in startup survival rates? <laughs> so is it, sorry, it was around round size or? Uh, what is your view on the fact that a lot of startups here don't seem to raise a lot of money, uh, given that we lead the nation in startup survival rates? Got it. So is it, I think it's around um, asking about the amount of capital being raised by companies here. Is that sufficient for them to be able to, to get to where they need to get to or not um, based on, I guess, trends you're seeing for, for the companies and their ability to use that dollar further? I, I think if the pandemic has proven anything, it's that great companies are going to get funded no matter where they are, frankly. So, you know, I, I'm not sure what that question is trying to get at. I, I do think um, like Minneapolis is a great market to build an early stage business. And I think um, if you have kind of that alchemy and that magic that we've talked about and you're close to your customer and your ability to retain talent, like you'll be able to raise capital from a coastal investor, from a non-coastal investor. Yeah. Just the reality of how much capital is in the market right now. Yep. Got it. Any other questions? Oh, 
Sorry, Dan, you have something? Yeah, the only thing I was <laughs> going to say uh, was like bigger is not always better with these things. Uh, when you look at our portfolio, uh, you know, the companies that are at least the furthest along or the most household names, like Datadog burned like $30 million to get to, you know, a billion in ARR almost now. Uh, Calendly is, yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. They burned like less than a million dollars probably to get to 100 million in ARR now. And I uh, expense by a similar story. Um, and I do think like raising just like how much money can I possibly raise? And then like, I'm going to go raise that. You do lose like discipline and focus and creativity. And those are like really important ingredients to, to build a business. So it's not to, to belittle the idea of like raising money is important and you do need to raise what you need. Um, but just because, you know, somebody raises, you know, 50, a hundred million dollars, like that's not the definition of success is like building a profitable, successful company. It's not like raising money. Um, and there is, value, I'm not saying there isn't value in raising money too, because there definitely is, but there's also value in like not raising, you know, having a bank account where you never even think about it. Um, it, it does breed like these things like creativity, like capital efficiency um, that are super, super valuable um, and that I really appreciate and that we definitely look for as a firm a lot. Great. Well, I think that's our time. So um, yeah, let's give a, a round of applause for our panelists here. Thank you for being here.